Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. In this episode, I'm joined by Greg Mulholland, founder and CEO of Citrine Informatics, which is applying AI to the discovery and development of new materials. Greg and I start out with an exploration of some of the challenges of the status quo in material science and what's to be gained by introducing machine learning into this process. We discuss how limitations in materials manifest themselves and Greg shares a few examples from the company's work optimizing battery components and solar cells. We dig into the role and sources of data used in applying machine learning in materials and some of the unique challenges to collecting it, as well as discuss the pipeline and algorithms Citrine uses to deliver its service. This was a fun conversation that spans physics, chemistry, and of course, machine learning, and I hope you enjoy it. All right, let's do it. All right, everyone, I am on the line with Greg Mulholland. Greg is founder and CEO of a company called Citrine Informatics. Greg and Citrine are focused on the application of AI to materials and chemistry, and I'm really looking forward to digging into that uh, in this show. Greg, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thanks, Sam. Really glad to be here. So tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get uh, started working in this intersection of materials and machine learning and AI? Well, when I started uh, my my college career, I was really focused. Actually, I was in a I was uh, focused on electrical engineering. So I was a computer engineer. I was doing processor design, uh, but I actually became fascinated by the fact that everything I kept running into in the electronics world, and and frankly, everything I kept running into among my mechanical engineering friends and product design friends, was that the materials that they had available to them were uh, really. Uh, the limiting factor in a lot of the products that they, that they loved. And so um, I actually, because I had this programming background, because I had this computer engineering background, I started thinking a lot about how can we use these machine learning techniques and use these advanced analytics techniques to accelerate this really important field. Um, and I actually ended up going into the materials field uh, purely. I, I worked in a, at a small semiconductor company where we made materials for LEDs and power electronics. And I saw exactly what I expected to, which was that it was, we were really good at generating huge volumes of data and frankly, pretty poor at using them effectively to make better decisions. And so when I met my, the person who became my co-founder, Bryce, uh, he had a background in machine learning for materials. And we kind of had this magical overlap of uh, you know, his expertise in analyzing data, my expertise in generating it. And it turns out there's a lot of cool things you can do in the materials industry by combining those two things. You mentioned running into some limitations of materials uh, early in your career. What are some of those limitations and uh, what are the, some of the ways that, um, you know, issues around materials manifest both for us as consumers and for businesses? Yeah. So for me, the first place I started was, was transistors. I started looking at, you know, how, what is limiting our processor speed? What is limiting our ability to, um, you know, kind of have, have these more advanced uh, processors and, and technologies around us. But as I looked into it more and more, I realized, you know, the fuel efficiency of every vehicle, the fuel efficiency of a plane, the batteries that power our electronics, the uh, medical devices that we, we put inside our bodies, um, they're all limited by our ability to make them out of things that do the job better than anything else. And so, you know, for me, I look around the world and see a a world f- filled with materials being used for things in the shape of products, not a world of products that stand on their own. Materials really are the enabling technology of of most things that we love today. Mm. Uh, so maybe give us some examples of materials that you've had an opportunity to, to work with and, you know, with Citrine? Yeah. So, so we actually started in, in a bunch of different energy materials. And so my passion, one of my passions has always been energy. And 
using things, I mean, it, when you take something like a battery, for example, a battery is simply uh, several layers of material stacked in an appropriate way to create a, uh, a highly engineered structure to store energy. And so um, one thing that Citrine has worked on quite a lot, actually, is figuring out how to optimize the anode, the cathode, the electrolyte, and other internal components of batteries to make them last longer, to have higher voltage, to be safer. Um, and, and that's been a, a real area for us where we've ha- had some pretty exciting results because the, um, you know, the, the, the reality is the, you know, none of us are happy with how our batteries perform. And so uh, being able to push those forward is, uh, is an exciting thing to be able to do. But, but we, we also have had an opportunity to discover new, uh, lightweight aerospace alloys. So 3d printable air, uh, alloys that make a, a plane lighter or an, a jet engine perform more efficiently because at the end of the day, the efficiency of these aircraft and, and you know, the cost of running them and the pollution they put out is limited very much by the weight and the performance of, of the materials in them. Um, so we, we really worked very, very broadly and we've seen the power of, of AI across everything from you know, new polymers and plastics to new glasses, to new uh, textile materials, to new paints and coatings, all the way to batteries and processors. So it's really a very broad industry with, with huge impact. I remember reading not too long ago, maybe six months ago or so, uh, some articles about some work that I think it was Autodesk was doing in printing, 3D printing. It was like the... Um, Basically, the walls that separate the different uh, cabins in an air in an aircraft. I forget the word for it. Oh, the, sort of the bulkhead. The bulkhead. Yeah, exactly. Um, you mentioned three D printing. Now, are you talking about the actual material that is used in the three D printing? Is what you worked on, or the something like they did with the generative design? Yeah. So, so I'm talking about the actual materials because in in the three D printing world. The tradition has been, and, and this makes perfect sense, that you know you have this list of of aluminum alloys or steels or you know various metals or plastics that you have used in a non three d printing way, right? You know we we have made things without using three d printing for a long time. And the idea is, hey, why don't we just make a powder out of them, put them in a three d printer, and then we three d print the part out of out of that material. And it turns out that the way a 3D printer works is actually pretty different from a normal manufacturing technique. And so what when you when you put those materials in, you get something very different out than you would using a traditional manufacturing technique. So we actually work with companies to help identify how do we modify these materials to actually create a more performant, better material that's optimized for 3D printing rather than just trying to take what we've used for 50 or 100 years and repurpose it into this totally new manufacturing mode. How are you applying AI machine learning to these types of problems? So materials presents a pretty unique set of challenges for an AI system. Um, and, And the reason for that is the demands on materials are different than most other uh, sort of machine learning applications. Um, for example, in if, if you take aluminum alloys, which is a very, you know, almost every plane is is has a huge number of different aluminum alloys in it because it's nice and light and it's very strong. Um, there's a big problem because when you talk, you know, most, most of the, the folks on your show uh, have access to many millions or tens of millions or even billions of data points about the things they're trying to target. Uh, when we talk about aluminum alloys, we're talking about maybe five to 10,000 data points that have ever been rigorously measured. And if you're talking about what any one person has, it can be just a few hundred or a few thousand. And so we're not in this world in materials and chemistry where we can sort of blindly throw deep learning at a huge data set and, and, and then refine it over time and get some really interesting good results. In, in materials and chemistry, we suffer from a, a small data problem. You know, and by the way, every additional data point is can cost millions of dollars. And so it's not even cheap to generate new data. It's actually a, a really big challenge. And so as we develop AI systems that are tailored at the materials industry, we actually have to focus on how do we use the limited data that we have available to us today to solve a really hard problem. Uh, and, and then the other the other piece, and there are, there are a lot of differences. Actually, before you move on from there, can you elaborate on when you say data point in this context, what you're specifically referring to? Sure. So when, when I talk about a data point, 
there are some canonical measurements that people do on materials. So, so take, for example, uh, a, an aluminum alloy. You would, te- you would test the strength of that material. How easy is it to break? How easy is it to scratch? Uh, and you get single numbers out or, or curves out of those tests. Um, and there are typically uh, six to ten of them in any area that are kind of the critical questions we ask before we use a material. How well does it fatigue? Does it corrode? Is it is it a material that will um, break if you smash something against it? Um, these are both for safety reasons and performance reasons the the critical questions we ask. But in in metals in particular, but in a lot of areas of high performance materials, you can do a test to to know how something ages that lasts for ten or a hundred thousand hours, and that is understandably a very expensive test to do. To what extent do the the data points uh, associated with or that can be uh, aggregated from the manufacturing process play into this? So I don't know, uh, you know, how long it takes to manufacture a given piece of aluminum, but assuming that there's some number of steps and there are a whole variety of process parameters and temperatures and humidities and things like this that uh, go into, you know, determining how strong and and light the uh, material will ultimately be. Um, are those also part of what you consider to be the data set or are you only looking at the properties of the final product? So, so that is absolutely part of the data set, but in a very interesting way. Uh, the way most materials companies work today is they have a, a factory or a plant that produces a handful of different materials in incredibly high volumes. And so, you know, if you're an Alcoa or you're a uh, Corning or you're a 3M, you know, you're, you, when you have manufacturing data, that manufacturing data is just terabytes and terabytes of data, petabytes of data over days and weeks about one material, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you, you have, it's, it's just a, a tremendous amount of depth on one material, the big change that's come to the materials industry that's that's really interesting is that while for some materials that's really important, you know, the demands on these materials companies is to come up with new materials faster. And, and the example I always use to love, or I always love to use, is uh, is Gorilla Glass. So, you know, I think a lot of people are familiar with uh, the Steve Jobs story about how that kind of came to be the front of the iPhone. But what people don't think about is that. Apple wants a new glass for their phone every year. They're an incredibly demanding company, and they are a company that wants to have the highest performing product on the market. And most materials companies uh, take three to five years or more to develop a new product. And so Apple is now saying to Corning, hey, I want a new glass every single year. And Corning has to figure out a way to do that, or else somebody else is going to come in and and provide that to Apple. And so uh, you you know, I think the big change that's come is that Companies are very good at producing what they produce very efficiently, and where that used to be enough, now there's a real push to be able to innovate faster and to come up with that next generation battery or next generation vehicle or next generation phone so much faster uh, that really the, the, the manufacturing information is helpful, but you really need a diversity of data around many different materials to help optimize for a particular use case. It is the implication of what you're saying that you're the kinds of customers you're targeting are not necessarily these, it's not kind of the production, the ongoing production of existing material as much as this R and D process to get to newer types of materials. That's exactly right. So, so we're really focused on enabling these, the world's finest materials companies to move much, much faster in the development and and deployment of new materials. And then, of course, we assist in the scale-up process and we assist in manufacturing optimization and those sorts of things. But where we're really differentiated is that ability to to take these relatively small, diverse development data sets and help companies come up with those new high-performance signature materials, in some cases, 50 to 70% faster than they would have been able to otherwise. All right. And so given the the way you've described this as kind of a small data problem, what's the what does the approach look like? So the beautiful thing about about materials is that we have a, a trick up our sleeve that most other industries don't. And that's that we have 
the laws of physics and chemistry in our pocket. You know, as scientists, we learned about how materials behave without ever seeing data. Um, and then at the end of our careers, as we got graduate degrees or went into industry, we saw the the data around materials help us refine what we believed about those materials performance. And, and we use machine learning in exactly the same way. When we have a a, a physical understanding of how atoms bond, for example, or or how uh, two elements in a in a particular material interact, we we use that those formulae, we use those relationships built into a machine learning system, built into a, a larger infrastructure. Um, but it turns out there are a lot of materials uh, mysteries in materials. Still, there are a lot of areas of materials where we don't exactly know the fundamental phenomena that are dominating, and so. What we say is for those, we have data. We, we're able to use the small amount of data we have to connect the theory we understand with the things we don't and more accurately fill in the gaps. And then the beautiful part about it is the companies we work with are highly experimentally oriented. And so they're constantly generating new data. And so just like a human, you know, a machine learning system can come in and actually learn alongside and, and be the perfect lab assistant. It never forgets anything. It's relatively unbiased. It is able to surface new ideas and it's able to help humans come up with better hypotheses, which lead to better results faster. Can you maybe uh, help us make this a little bit more concrete by talking about uh, in the context of one of these examples that you've given, you know, what the process might look like, what the pipeline might look like, what some of the systems and algorithms look like that help you uh, get to, you know, developing new materials more quickly? Sure. Absolutely. There, there are, like I said, there are many, many places we've worked, but, but one in particular that, that I always like to think about, uh, was with a, a solar cell company. Um, and so we, we worked on a, a specific class of solar cell. Um, and, and basically the goal was they wanted to absorb light at a certain wavelength. You know, they want to make sure they're absorbing light that's coming in from the sun. Um, they wanted to do it at a highly efficiently and they wanted it to be, you know, sort of have these specific stability requirements. You obviously don't want your so solar cell to degrade over time. And, and so what we did is we said, look, you have a lot of fundamental data about, the solar absorbance of a material. So it's, you know, there's sort of all these electronic calculations that people have done for years and years. And actually a Nobel prize was awarded for coming up with these relationships. Um, and, and so we said, well, you have that knowledge to begin with. So let's, let's not reinvent that. We don't need to learn the relationships that won a Nobel prize from, you know, several hundred data points. We just can put that into the system. And then what we do is we say the goal of what you have it, or of, of your final product is the solar cell with these six or eight or 10 particular properties. In this case, it was about 10. Uh, and, and, and what we did is we said the data that we have can help us bridge from the fundamental relationship that we have. So we'll put those equations in. We're going to use that alongside data in a, in a framework that, uh, that I can, I'm happy to describe in a moment. And then we're going to generate a set of hypotheses for what new materials might achieve the goals that you've set out to achieve. And this is the real key because what we don't want to do and what AI is not likely to do anytime soon is to say, aha, here's your one right answer. Go make it. What AI is very good at doing in, in materials and chemistry is to say, here are some highly probable candidates you should go try those. A human will select a few to try them. And then as new data is generated, that gets folded back into the algorithm and it's allowed to obviously relearn and, and retrain um, and then make a set of new suggestions. And, and that's very in line with the scientific method. You hypothesize, you test, you conclude something and you come back with a new, better hypothesis. hypothesis. And the, the AI system simply helps you do that much more efficiently. Mm. One of the themes that uh, surfaces on the podcast pretty frequently is the this idea that you're poking out a little bit. Um, some of the approaches like deep learning take the approach that you just alluded to, take a whole bunch of data, you know, independent of any laws of physics or chemistry and throw it at this deep learning model and let it try to figure everything out. Um, whereas you've incorporated those laws of physics and chem chemistry. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you have made those to coexist in a machine learning framework? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so we have a couple things that we truly believe in as sort of a philosophical basis here. And I, I honestly think we've seen a lot more of this emerge in the, in the AI community over the last year or two, because I think we as a community realize how important they are. Uh, the first is we believe in interpretability. Um, you know, I, I think one of the big challenges in, in deep learning actually is that you can throw a lot of data at things and you can sort of see what some of the neurons are doing, but a lot of times there's a big black box component to what's going on uh, because we sort of manually insert these relationships in or, or automatically insert them, but insert known relationships into these systems, understanding how they, they construct themselves is really important. Um, the second thing that we really believe in, which drives the, the answer to your question is uncertainty. So one of the big problems in, in AI for, for scientific applications is that, you know, when you talk about things like recommendation engines, you know, if Netflix tells you you're going you're gonna to like something with uh, four stars and you end up hating it, your plane doesn't fall out of the sky. You know, it's okay for Netflix to be wrong every once in a while and it can sort of uh, narrow itself in on your preferences over time. For us, we work with scientists who believe that there's a you know, that, that who understand uncertainty and who understand when a model is confident or not. And so what we actually do is we build these very large graph networks where rather than having a, a black box situation like deep learning, we're building a graph that's, that's not so different from a, a, a deep lear, a, a deep net, but has a, uh, has nodes that we can control in it. Some of those nodes are new data. Some of those those nodes are uh, machine learning systems, whether they're uh, deep learning. You know, we'll use deep learning for things like images um, or or more sort of standard machine learning systems, you know, forests or, or neural nets or what have you. you know, we can really put anything into these networks. Um, and then we can also conveniently put in you know, Arrhenius equations or uh, reaction equation, reaction rates. I mean, in some ways, we sort of program high school chemistry and college chemistry into the base levels of these nodes so that when a, when the, the system is constructing these networks and is testing nodes and is, is sort of moving through the possible uh, models it can build, it's able to access things that are not just you know, the, the billion images of cats and not cats that we have labeled. It's It's actually looking at what is the what is the underlying chemistry and how does that connect between data and chemistry to minimize the uncertainty of the model? So we actually use uncertainty as a first class member of our system. And that really helps us drive kind of model quality and hypothesis generation in this larger framework of kind of graphically connected uh, machine learning models. Is there a simple example or way to explain the way the system uses and navigates these nodes that, um, you know, can help us really, uh, generate some intuition for how it works? Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a battery as an example. So uh, a battery is basically uh, three layers of material, an anode, a cathode, and, and, a, and an electrolyte. And those three materials are stacked cathode, electrolyte, anode, and the, the charge moves between the two ends, and that's how you, how you have a battery work. Um, the three materials you choose are critical because – you know, if they're not compatible with each other or if they don't take advantage of each other's strengths, you're not going to have a perform performant battery. And so that at a very high level is, is very simple. But if you, th if you think as a material scientist would about this problem, you actually realize there's a, a stacked set of, of problems that all build up together. Um, and what I mean by that is each of those materials is composed of atoms. And, and so when you talk about lithium ion, obviously lithium is the, is the primary ion that's moving around in, in that battery. Now, the atom you choose is important. There are sodium batteries. There are aluminum batteries. There are batteries based on many elements. And we have – and so, so the atoms matter. But atoms aren't all that matter. So actually how the atoms bond together matters a lot. And so that's sort of the next layer up is how these things interconnect with one another. Um, and then you can start thinking about, well, if they bond together one-to-one -one, – what happens when you zoom out a little further and say, what happens over, you know, a micrometer or what happens over a centimeter? Um, you know, obviously you don't have perfect bonding. Nothing is perfect. So you have things that are happening over much larger length scales. And then you finally talk about what happens when you layer these three materials together and how do you optimize them all at once? And so what, what we do is we say we have good understanding about what a lithium atom is. We have a very good understanding about how a lithium ion bonds to an oxygen ion. We have a very good understanding of how 
uh, things happen over large distances. But what we don't have a good understanding of as a materials community is how to explicitly connect all of that knowledge at the different length scales in such a way that allows us to draw really accurate conclusions and build really accurate models of how these materials will behave. And so what that means is we're really good at understanding one little piece of the problem, but it's very hard to zoom out and see the whole forest and understand what the whole structure is. And so we actually use when I say we build these graphical models, the graphical models are actually combinations of uh, data and and these underlying sort of single length scale models to allow us to connect uh, the, the data and ML allows us to connect the different length scales and actually create better models that incorporate everything from, you know, high school chemistry. What is, you know, how, how many electrons does this particular element have all the way up to what happens if I leave it in the oven for an extra hour all the way up to what happens when I seal it in there with two other materials and how well does the battery perform over time? In the case of an example like that, what would be, you've got some of these nodes in this graph represent data points about the materials and the atoms and the things that you've described. Uh, and then some others represent machine learning models. What would those be and what's the relationship that they play in this graph? Yeah, so so the the machine learning models are will, will say things like, well, you know, we understand how the lithium atoms all uh, sort of behave one to one, and we understand how bonding happens at a very large scale, but we don't understand how swapping ten percent of the lithium out for silicon might actually affect the overall performance of the battery. We can't know that how that propagates through the system, and so that's where we use data and and machine learning to identify trends across very large uh, or, or these data sets that contain sort of diverse materials data that allows us to kind of zero in on on uh, some specific higher performance and and the other thing that it allows us to do is to actually answer a question that most ai is actually quite bad at answering um, you know, in, in most in most AI systems, the goal is to identify things that are pretty similar to other things, you know, facial recognition, you know, it, it's looking for faces that are similar to faces it's seen before. For us, our AI systems are actually trying to to reorient things and look for uh, new new materials outside of the current space. And so it might be that we're looking at lithium and silicon together and then all of a sudden somebody has a great idea that putting some carbon in there could be a real help. Well, if no one's ever used carbon before, you have to have a really crafty way of being able to represent what that looks like so that the machine learning system can lock onto any signal at all. And so the representations among these hierarchical units allows us to say, uh, to, to insert changes like that and actually begin to push the envelope of what's possible rather than just saying, oh yes, this is 50% between two things I've seen. I'm just going to, you know, take a, uh, sort of lo do a logistic regression between the two and take the midpoint and have that be the, uh, the, the result of, of my prediction. So is it fair to say that the, the, the nodes in this graph ultimately re represent some kind of material or chemical characteristics, some of which you have direct data about, and so you can insert those data points directly, and others you're using machine learning to infer based on some other data that you have. So it's kind of like a, you know, a hierarchical graph of these characteristics. Is that, is that that's, fair? That's precisely correct. Okay. And so ultimately then you are applying addition on another level of machine learning on top of this graph to try to uh, infer or learn about the relationships between the these different characteristics and then predict where you might find new materials that um, produce some desired result. That, that, that's exactly right. So it's, you know, you can imagine in the, in the gorilla glass example, because it's a, you know, I think we, we all know what the demands are on that, right? We don't want it to break. We don't want it to scratch. Uh, we want it to be nice and transparent and pretty light. And that's more or less the, the property set you're looking for. And so what we would say is let's put those targets into the system and then use an optimization system, whether AI based or not. And it kind of depends on the use case, whether that makes sense um, to actually optimize the materials that the the processing, the input elements, uh, you know, sort of everything about that glass to achieve the thinnest, lightest, uh, 
uh, strongest, most scratch resistant Gorilla Glass possible. And and we do that hand in hand with the scientists because it turns out that scientific expertise is absolutely critical. And so is that optimization step where you is is the system spitting out other materials or compounds or uh, or is it rather saying, you know, you're looking for something that has, you know, this degree of distance to this other material or, you know, is it is it relative or is it giving you absolute things to investigate? Oh, it actually gives you absolute things to investigate. So in the case of a glass, we would give you a specific chemical formula and we would potentially give you even processing steps that that we believe to be the things that that will achieve the goal you're trying to achieve. And 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 we we return those. I mean, that's this is all part of the the software system, right? This isn't this isn't human driven. But the but the scientist on the other end, the person who's developing that next generation material, will look at that list and say, well, you know, it turns out you have suggested a glass that has uh, lead in it. Well, that might be a great glass. I don't really want to make it, so we're going to avoid that one, and we are going to move on and say, actually, these other three are very interesting. So the scientist will then exert their intuition to say, I'm going to go make those now. And when I make them, I will return the data into the system, which obviously uh, helps us map the data space better and helps us provide even better recommendations. So it's a it's a sequential learning system that allows us to uh, work hand in hand with the scientists to to develop those next generation products. What does that process for working with scientists look like from a kind of timeline perspective? You know, it really varies based on the domain. Um, there are, materials and chemistry is just an incredibly diverse industry. Uh, I think it's easy from the outside to say, oh, well, you know, it's it's kind of uh, one one monolithic industry, but there's actually more than a dozen subgroups. Uh, in most cases, though, we we first work with a scientist to identify the the data that underpins uh, what they believe to be the most important signals and trends in in their industry. Uh, these scientists have, in some cases, spent decades working in a specific area and know their industry incredibly well, or know their their uh, area incredibly well. Um, and so, so we always start there, and, and and then what we do is we say, you know, look, we we can we can build these this we just call them first pass models. We kind of help them construct these these the first version of the graph. And then we allow them to begin to edit the graph. We allow them to insert nodes. We allow them to uh, create latent variables, add additional data, and really strike up a scientific conversation with the system uh, that refines over time. The first you know, little bit of somebody using our system is not directly going to experiment. It's learning how to you know, operate this powerful new tool. And then over time, they, they begin to add data. They begin to gain confidence in why the system is recommending what it's recommending. And once they have that confidence, it's very easy for us to say, hey, you know, why don't you go try to make this, make this material, give it a try. And I'll tell you what, it almost never works perfectly the first time. There's, you know, the model is never right on on target the first time. But what it does is it creates this, this back and forth conversation between the AI system and the expert scientist to be able to say, you as an expert scientist are not perfect every time. Humans are are deeply flawed in, in many ways with respect to data. And an AI system is uh, frankly deeply flawed uh, no matter how hard you try in, in completely understanding what humans have learned about chemistry. But as a team, there's a really powerful back and forth effect where uh, you know the, the AI system can learn and have additional information injected into it. And the human can can release some of that data analysis burden and start to think creatively about how to solve these really difficult problems. Have you run into any use cases that the system just isn't able to handle yet? And uh, if so, what are you know what what are the sources of those limitations? You know, we, we haven't run into anything that is a, a complete and abject failure. Um, I, I think one of the reasons for that is that there's a uh, that there's a sort of assumption that that it, it is an iterative process. And so that's a you know, if, if you sort of understand it to always be a, a, a hill climb in some ways, um, you know, you, you kind of don't taking failure is uh, or you know, saying it failed completely is is sort of impossible. But I will say, you know, one of the things that that we found to be very interesting is that 
there are some areas of materials where there is so little knowledge or there is such a uh, breadth of, of theory about why something happens that it can actually be really challenging to, um, to use uh, an AI system to, do, to, to have a great effect. And an example there I'd use is superconductors. So this is a, a, a type of material that when you cool it down to below liquid nitrogen temperature or even colder, um, the, they are wires that have no resistance. So you, know, you, you could use them to very efficiently transmit electricity, for example, and this is something they're used for. Um, but there are a few different classes of superconductors. Uh, pretty much any time a new superconductor is discovered, a Nobel Prize is awarded. Um, and the theory that underpins it, there are some very strong theories, but the way that we capture data and the way that we understand these things to work uh, is, is wholly incomplete. Um, and so I think there are, there are certainly areas of materials where, you know, we just don't have the, the grounding uh, to, to build a, an AI system that is going to really uh, kind of break into that new space because the data landscape isn't dense enough. And, and the, the underlying theory that we would normally inject is uh, frankly not so well understood that we can do that with great confidence. Uh, and so I would actually say that that's one of the, um, one of the biggest challenge areas. And there are a few, a few areas like that where, you know, they're, they're new enough that, you know, we just don't have established uh, knowledge theory or data that allows us to, to really model these things. Well, how has the, the product evolved? Like what was your MVP and how have you iterated, uh, over time to get to the platform that you have now? So when we, when we first started, uh, the MVP was my, my co-founder Bryce sitting behind a keyboard, uh, kind of manually tuning up machine learning models in, in whatever appropriate tool set worked at the time. Um, and, and really was working with primarily academic groups to, to show that, that there might even be some value here. Uh, you know, most materials companies see their their development data as their crown jewels. And and I literally every company we've talked to has referred to it that way. And this is at this point, hundreds of companies. Um, and and the, the interesting thing about it is, um, you know, working with these academic groups allowed us to really get an understanding of the development workflow uh, in a very open, open way. Um, what we realized, though, is that as we went into companies, there, there's this uh, schizophrenia to what they want. Uh, on one hand, everyone is hungry to use AI in a new way. Everyone is hungry to have AI be their savior in one way or another. And you know, I, I'm, I don't need to tell you about the buzz in the industry, right? You know, it's it's on everybody's uh, everybody's lips right now. Mm -hmm. um, but the the other side of it is in the materials and chemicals industry, the presence and, and organization of data is actually in general quite poor. Um, you know, there are only a few different, uh, well, there, there, basically no company has a very large database, you know, a la Google and search results or, you know, any Silicon Valley company and their digital data. Most materials companies have been collecting data on, you know, in, in manual logbooks for the better part of 50 or 100 years. And so there's data out there, but in general, it's pretty tough to get at. And so actually what we've, what we've learned is that the AI tools are really nice and incredibly powerful and, and drive a lot of value. But actually the first step as we work with people is to go into these organizations and say, Hey, you need to start organizing your data in a way that makes it available to advanced analysis, whether it's AI or even just, you know, very simple sorts of visualizations. Um, and to actually go and, and, Build the platform that will allow people to organize materials and data, uh, materials and chemistry data in a rational way, uh, has been a layer of the platform we've had to to build and continue to refine because it turns out AI without any underlying data is not super useful, uh, and most of these companies don't have the the sort of presence in house yet to to do that themselves, and so we ha we had to add this extra layer, which has been great because what it means is as a company we are able to both create sort of the instantaneous value of we're helping you organize this stuff for the long term. We're helping you create long term value. And then we also get to come in with the really cool AI results and say, oh, by the way, we're helping you generate your next, you know, your next generation products in in five or seven business units and and look at how cool these results are. Look at how excited your scientists are. So in some ways, you know, I think we've 
stumbled into a really cool business here because we get to be an ally to everyone in the organization, which is frankly, usually rare in, in B2B businesses. Great. Well, uh, this has been super interesting. Are there uh, any additional thoughts that you'd like to share? You know, I think the, the the last thought I'd like to share is is just that there's, you know, when we started the company, people, we, we had, you know, we, we obviously have some great investors. We're super excited about them. Um, but when we were originally pitching, a great number of investors said, generalized AI is going to eat your lunch. That is the future. And, and the specialty domain specific stuff really is never going to have any value. And, <laughs> and, and I think, you know, I think you've seen, uh, you know, just based on, on the, the guests in your show and, and, you know, I, I, and I know we've seen that the resurgence of domain specific AI has showed that AI is an incredibly powerful tool. It's an incredible way to do a lot of, of fast tasks faster. And it's an incredible way to, to kind of optimize how we behave in a lot of ways. But in materials and chemistry, the the domain specificity is incredibly important and and so as we've kind of grown as a company one thing i've realized is that you know kind of sharing that message with people and, and understanding that yeah you know what you can do with scikit learn is interesting what you can do with these open source tools is interesting and powerful but if you really want to go deep merging domain expertise and and uh, kind of ai expertise uh, ml expertise if you can merge those effectively you can have a super powerful tool that's really differentiated from what anyone else has. And so I guess if I, you know, kind of were to send a message to your listeners, it's, you know, you don't have to be Andrew Ng to go and, and dominate the materials or to, to dominate a, a segment of AI. You have to bring your worldview and your expertise and combine it with a really effective AI strategy. And that is the way to actually have real world impact, or at least that's what we've seen. And and it's led to some really exciting results. And I couldn't be more proud to have been part of this team, which has really uh, broken new ground in, in materials and chemistry. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, well, Greg, I really appreciate you taking the time to share what you're up to. I will, I'm looking forward to kind of keeping track of, uh, of Citrine and, and the work that you're doing. Well, thanks a lot, Sam. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been awesome to be on. I, I've, I love your show and uh, I've really enjoyed our chat this morning. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on Greg or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimlai.com slash talk slash 148. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.